Thank you, choir. Uh, let us pray. Creator God, thank you for the opportunity to reflect and think about our relationship with you and other people. Open our minds to learn and grow in understanding and faith. Amen. Today, Marilyn read uh, Psalm 139, verses 1 to 18. This type of psalm is generally referred to as a hymn of thanksgiving, as the psalmist or psalmists sing thanks to God for God's greatness, goodness, and protection. The psalm begins with a powerful and profound statement. You've searched me and known me. The words and the imagery in the psalm suggest that God knows everything about us. Even if we try to escape God, God will be with us. The psalmist says, Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed a grave, you are also there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand hold me fast. There are many stories in the Bible that remind us about the inescapable presence of God. For example, in the book of Jonah, we read, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Rise up, go to Nineveh, that great city. Well, we all know this story from Sunday school. We know what happened. Jonah tried to flee the presence of God. He tried to run away. He traveled to the coastal city of Joppa and secured passage on a ship bound for Tarshish. There was a violent storm. And Jonah knew through this that he was being sought after by God. The seamen on the ship were frightened. So Jonah asked the mariners to throw him overboard, and then, of course, he was swallowed by a large fish. However, Jonah survived, and he heard the voice of God a second time. Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim the message that I tell you. Jonah realized that there was no escaping the presence of God. This time he traveled to Nineveh and spread the message that God had given him. The biblical commentator Nancy de Clese Walford notes that in our reading today, the psalmist frequently uses the second person pronoun, you. The psalm is about the relationship between I and you, with you being God. The Jewish philosopher and theologian Martin Buber wrote about the idea of I and thou and I and it. Now I offer my apologies to Martin Buber and all students of philosophy and theology, but I think in its simplest form, the idea of I and it refers to objectification in relationships. When we are an object in a relationship, or when we ourselves objectify a person that we relate to, we experience a lack of humanity and an inability to care for and about others. Perhaps the most extreme examples of this might be found in war and conflict. Opposing forces use derogatory names to dehumanize the other. It's easier to kill a person if they are an object and not a human being like us. However, even in everyday life, most of us have probably experienced this objectification in relationships, in one way or another. Now, I'm a, a privileged white male, and on the surface at least, I enjoy the benefits that come with that privilege. However, my apparent privilege has not always protected me from objectification and marginalization. I started grade school in the late 1950s, 1958 to be precise. This was less than 15 years after the end of World War II. Although I'm a third-generation Canadian and fourth-generation North American, I still have a German surname. Some of my classmates, when I started school, had fathers, uncles, grandfathers who served in the Canadian military, and some, in fact, had relatives who were wounded or killed in World War II. Now, I also had several relatives who served in the Canadian military during World War II, but all of this didn't really matter as I was frequently referred to as a kraut, a jerry, or a junker. 
and periodically I bore the burden of taunts and even physical bullying. The experience was sometimes emotionally painful, and though I, I, I couldn't explain it or articulate it as a child, I think the emotional pain had a lot to do with being objectified, being othered, of becoming an it, something less than a human being. My experience as a child, though personally painful, was mild compared to the experiences of vast numbers of people throughout history. In Canada, we, we pride ourselves about being a diverse nation with civil liberties and a sense of equality for all. However, we know all too well that our history has not been kind to everyone. Whether it was the residential school system that sought to destroy the culture and identity of indigenous children, whether it was the head tax on Chinese immigrants, the forced internment and confiscation of the property of Canadians of Japanese descent, or the institutionalization and forced sterilization of people with mental illness and developmental disabilities, we have a long history of treating people as objects rather than human beings. I sometimes find it hard to believe that in a province like BC, people of South Asian descent didn't have the right to vote until 1947. The list of wrongs is long, and I could easily take up all of our time citing the injustices directed at so many different groups of people. Now, in the reading from the Psalms, the objectification found in so many relationships is not what the psalmist is talking about. The psalmist is talking about the opposite. It is the I and you relationship, or what is more often called the I and thou relationship. This is a different kind of relationship where we're not objectified and othered, but we are accepted and embraced for who we are. The psalmist says, How precious are your thoughts to me! How impossible to number them! I could no more count them than I could count the sand. But suppose I could. You would still be with me. God is always with us. Jesus offers us the example of how to live in a true relationship where, where we respect and value other people, not as objects that we can manipulate, use, and abuse, but as people who deserve our love, our care, and our understanding. Jesus embraced those on the margins of society. He shared bread and spent time with people who were shunned and avoided by those in power. His love and genuine acceptance gave the people who knew him a sense of worth, and the sense of dignity. His willingness to accept people raised concerns among many of the traditional religious leaders as Jesus wasn't afraid to go against social convention. In John chapter 4, we read one of the best examples of Jesus' willingness to enter new territory in the acceptance and valuing of people. John tells us that Jesus had to travel through Samaria, and while on this journey, he came to a town called Sychar, Jesus decided to rest by a well, thought to be Jacob's ancient well, when a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus started a conversation with her and asked for a drink of water. Now taken at face value in today's society, this interaction would not be seen as unusual. However, we have to consider the conversation within the historical and social context. Jesus lived in a highly patriarchal society, in which men did not talk to women in public places, not even their own wives, let alone talk to women about theological matters. Furthermore, the woman at the well was a Samaritan, and the Samaritans were despised by the Jews who regarded them as a form of heretical sect or group. Matters were further complicated by the fact that this woman had had multiple marriages. In short, it was inappropriate in so many ways for Jesus to be seen with this woman and for them to be speaking together. However, Jesus persisted in the conversation and told her about a new way of being, a new way to live our lives. Jesus accepted the woman completely without prejudice, and she came to feel accepted and loved in a genuine way. In relationships, this idea of acceptance is critically important. I worked as a social worker in child welfare and community mental health before coming to UNBC in, in Prince George. In social work, like other human service professions, 
Communication and relationship building are extremely important. When I first started training in education as a social worker, I was introduced to the ideas and methods of Carl Rogers, an American psychologist, educator, and psychotherapist. Rogers, along with Abraham Maslow, developed and promoted an alternative way to deal with human growth and psychological pain. The ideas of Rogers had strong influence on the methods used in public ed education, as well as the so-called helping professions like nursing, psychology, social work, and so on. Rogers was born in Chicago in 1902, and he died in 1987. His father was an engineer, and the family were devoutly religious. In 1922, when Rogers was 20 years of age, he attended a Christian youth conference in Beijing, China. This experience had a profound effect on Rogers, the young white man from the Midwestern United States who had led a very sheltered life. He was exposed to a different culture, a different worldview, and this challenged his upbringing, his faith, and his understanding of life. Although his spiritual beliefs were shaken by this, this experience, he attended a theological seminary, but left after two years to enter teacher's college. From there, he went on to obtain his MA and his PhD in psychology. He became an agnostic, only returning to the spiritual beliefs in his old age. Yet the ideas he developed show a strong connection to the ideas of relationship that we value as Christians. As a psychologist, uh, Rogers began work within a psychoanalytic paradigm. At the time, there were two approaches to helping human beings who were experiencing emotional distress or psychological problems. One was psychoanalytic therapy, pioneered by Freud and his various uh, disciples, such as Jung, Adler. And the other was the behavioral approach developed by people like B.F. Skinner. Rogers didn't feel comfortable with either of these methods as they were both highly deterministic. They didn't give people a sense of choice and free will. Rogers believed in the fundamental worth of each person and their capacity to make choices that would promote growth and development. He created a, a humanistic approach to helping that is sometimes usually referred to as client-centered therapy. Now, in Rogers' approach, the most important thing is the relationship between the therapist and the person seeking help, or the person he called the client. Rogers believed that if the therapist was genuine, congruent, and communicated something called unconditional positive regard, that positive change and growth could occur. This would happen because the person seeking help felt accepted and felt safe to be truly open, honest, and human. This idea of unconditional positive regard has a far-reaching influence in the field of public education as well as the helping professions. Today we consider Rogers' approach somewhat simplistic, but many of the basic ideas, such as the respect and unconditional positive regard that he held for people, continue to be important values and characteristics of an effective teacher and an effective therapist. The idea of unconditional positive regard is the essence of Jesus' love for us. He taught us that we are loved and acceptance. The idea of acceptance is so important to each one of us. In my work with people who were broken, downtrodden, and who experienced nothing but despair in life, the simple act of unconditional acceptance was so important to them. It gave the individual a sense of hope and a sense that there might be possibilities in their lives. I've been thinking a lot about broken relationships this week, and these thoughts have been triggered by two political events. In Canada, we saw the unprecedented resignation of the Governor General, Julie Payette. We don't know the whole story behind this resignation, but we've learned that the Governor General created a so-called toxic work environment in which people were belittled, humiliated, and bullied, often in front of their co-workers. Employees became objects to be treated with disrespect and a lack of compassion. The employees lived in fear and were apprehensive about going to work each day. These feelings are not unique to what happened at Rideau Hall. When I was employed as a child protection social worker, I worked with many kids who were neglected, witnessed family violence, and experienced physical and sexual abuse. 
The neglect and the abuse were awful, painful experiences. However, it was the emotional abuse that accompanied this trauma that was at least as painful, if not more so. The children were objectified in what should have been a loving and nurturing relationship, a relationship which should have given them a sense of safety and allowed them to develop a sense of self-esteem and self-worth. It's not surprising when we look around that many of the most marginalized people in our society, those who are homeless and live on the streets, are victims of childhood abuse. The second political event that got me thinking about relationships was the inauguration of the new administration in the United States. Much has been written about how fractured and broken relationships in our close ally and neighbor nation are today. The new president seems to be fully aware of the depth of these divisions. In his inaugural address, he spoke about the uncivil society that is America today, a society in which there are deep divisions between rural and urban residents, between African Americans and white Americans, and between Republicans and Democrats. In his speech, he tried to address these divisions. He said, let us listen to one another, hear one another, see one another, show respect to one another. He went on to say, there are some days when we need a hand. There are other days when we're called on to lend one. That is how we must be with one another. These are inspirational words, and I think all of us wish President Biden the very best in trying to bring people together and heal the divisions within his country. It will be a daunting task, especially within the midst of a global pandemic that has killed more Americans than died in the violence of World War II. It's easy to feel a sense of despair these days. Public health measures related to COVID-19 require us to physically distance from other people and isolate ourselves as much as we can. All of us do this not just because it is encouraged by public health authorities, but also because we care about our fellow human beings and we want them to be as safe and healthy as possible. Still, it is trying time, and it is difficult. We can take some comfort from another psalmist. In Psalm 62, we read, For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge, is in God. God is always with us. It is the I and thou relationship at the foundation of our existence. We are encouraged to make I and thou a part of all our relationships. Even when we disagree with people and their ideas, we need to show them love and respect. Let us all reflect on when we treat other people as objects and not human beings. Let us think about times when we have been unkind or uncaring in our relationships with others. Let us think about how we can become better human beings and better Christians who follow in the path of Jesus. Amen.